So what is FDA's refuse to accept policy? So FDA developed some criteria for assessing whether or not our 510Ks are good enough to even get in the front door. Um, they issued the final guidance in December of 2012, and we've now had a year to see how this works. The idea being that better quality 510Ks coming in would lead to faster review times, et cetera. Um, and all of us have read a report or a blog or an article or two about FDA complaining that the 510Ks they get are not of good quality, and woe is FDA because they just can't do our reviews any faster and get us our devices cleared because our submissions are just so bad. So they came up with the refuse to accept policy. Um, the idea at FDA was they want to focus their resources on reviewing really good submissions, not crummy ones, um, enhance the, the uh, consistency of their accept acceptance criteria, um, and the, the, they purported this policy to be about assessing the completeness of our submissions, um, not the quality of the submission. So, and then they would get back to us in 15 days. So what have we seen so far? There should be a difference, right, between an administrative and a substantive review. RTA is intended to be an administrative review. So is it a device? It's kind of, they have some preliminary questions. You can go to their website and there's a laundry list of them, but they're gonna look at it and say, well, is, is, your, is your widget even a device? Does it belong here? Uh, did, you pay, did you pay your fees? Um, is the 510K the right submission? Maybe it, you don't need a 510K or maybe you should have a PMA. Are you even in the right um, space? And then the presence or absence of required components, right? This should be a checklist. Do they have their user fee documentation? Do they have their um, DCs? Do they have their device description, et cetera? Resulting in a refuse to accept or you move on to substantive review. So it should be pretty straightforward. Um, substantive review, we expect it's gonna be our review of the 510Ks. It's the quality of your components, whether or not you have substantial equivalence, um, going through the AI requests and response, the cycle and process that we're all used to with the review of 510Ks. Um, and this should result in a binding determination of substantial equivalence or a failure of that, and you move on from there. Um, Marjorie Schulman actually said that, quote, there will be no evaluation of the adequacy of content or rationale as part of RTA. So what did we get? So here's the RTA checklist. <laughs> I don't know if any of y'all have seen this. Um, it is enormous. Um, it has multi-part questions. There's separate sections for different pieces. Um, and it is uh, anything but administrative. If you look through it, uh, there's definitely a blurred line between that administrative and substantive review. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about what happened when it, this was implemented at FDA over this past year. So in 2013, FDA received 2,965 510Ks. Um, they accepted through RTA. This is not substantial equivalence determinations. This is just getting past RTA. Uh, only 1,197 of them. 58% of the 510Ks that showed up at FDA's door were turned back under the RTA guidance based on the checklist that they have. So what, what happened? Some of the anecdotes that we've seen, there are blogs, you can Google this. Um, FDA Law Blog had a fantastic um, review, kind of uh, looking back, if you will. And there were any number of reasons um, that kind of baffle the imagination with regard to why these were turned away, um, including um, uh, failure to indicate whether a vinyl glove had software and had passed the electrical safety standards. Um, there were substantive questions, too, regarding shelf life. Uh, they also turned them away for misprints, pagination problems. I think one of the anecdotes I heard was there were two page 17s, and so they turned it away. It wasn't good enough, got to go back, send it to us again. Um, failure to state whether a condom was patient contacting. So, you know, just little things like this that kind of baffle, um, baffle us in terms of, is this really what RTA uh, should be about? 
Uh, real quick, I'm gonna actually turn it over to Rob, who's gonna share with you some anecdotes um, based on his experience um, filing submissions. And then um, Jorge's gonna talk to you a little about what, what this failure of RTA, if you will, um, means for your new product development cycle. Uh, and then Rob has some really great suggestions for getting through it. So Rob, do you wanna tell us some of your war stories in this regard? Yes, thank you. Um, I work with the, several different clients right now. I'm working on some 510Ks uh, for those clients. And um, when you put together a submission for the client and they're reviewing the records before the, it gets submitted, I get these kinds of questions. They can't believe that we need to be this detailed. And oftentimes they've done a 510K submission themselves before and they're looking at my submission versus the one that they prepared before on the predicate device, and they're saying, why do we have so much more detail? We didn't have to do this before, why do we need this? Or I'm asking for information for a certain section, and they say, well, why, I didn't need to provide this information before, and it's simply because that's the level of detail that this RTA checklist is requiring. That's the level of detail that the FDA is scrutinizing submissions. They're, they're not asking questions about uh, safety and efficacy, they're asking you to dot your I's, cross your T's, and then do it 10 more times. And then it'll be almost good enough to be rejected. So it's, it's a ridiculous hurdle that they're asking companies to go through, and it, it's not meant to be, is your submission complete? This is not an administrative process. This is uh, clearly blurring the lines between an administrative review and a substantive review. But that doesn't mean you're gonna stop submitting uh, 510Ks because you're not gonna stop making new product innovations. And some of these submissions that companies are submitting are special 510Ks, which is just a catch up saying, you know, we've, we've made these minor modifications over time, we, we wanna catch up, or the FDA is telling you, you shall catch up and tell us what changes you've made since the last 510K. And so it should, be a, it should be shorter, it should only tell you what the differences are, yet we're still getting really tough questions about things that make no sense, things that shouldn't even be applicable, but they want us to connect the dots anyway. So the, when I get these kinds of questions, you need to understand this, the FDA 510K submission process is nothing like it was in 2003, 2004, even up through 2007. Um, you might be able to figure out what political trigger might have caused all this, but I'm not sure a change the other direction will make it any better. I think the new FDA's 510K process is here to stay and it's only going to get worse, not better, because the FDA really doesn't like the 510K process. Back to you. So everybody should be familiar with this particular uh, at least this is my version, Exponent's version of the new product development cycle. And the reason I brought this up is because we're always thinking about people, process, and product. And the standard of reasonable, reasonableness went a little bit out the window with RTA. And we'll talk a little bit about why, aside from the politics. Ms. Shulman, Dr. Shulman talked about this to the FDLI at the FDLI conference last year. And this is what the FDA saw. So politics aside, this is the data the, the FDA saw. They looked back in industry for about 10 years, and what they saw is it was an increase in the average number of review cycles. That as far as they were concerned, industry was getting worse and worse because they had to intervene more and more in these review cycles. Number two, our reaction time slowed down. So if we got 180 days, at 179.5 days, we would come back. So obviously, it was industry's fault that uh, innovation was slowed down. The third is that over 80% of the AI letters, when the FDA called up and said, or sent you a letter saying, we need more information, there was inconsistencies in the submission, or they were missing some of the admin requirements. So that's a pretty big number, and it was leveraged uh, to justify this initiative. And the last thing is, there was actually an old RTA checklist. Did anybody know that? Did anybody know it existed? Anybody in this room? That's what I thought. Nobody ever used it. So we took the baby, the bathwater, threw it out, and, and started on this process. And it's actually unfair to put it all on the FDA. 
because we are partially responsible as industry. What is the number one you know, bitch point about the, bitching point about the FDA? It takes forever, right? Well, we asked for it. Within 15 days, we're gonna tell you whether we're gonna look at your 510K or not. So that's like your mom when you come in and you, you tell a lie, okay, this is what I'm gonna do to you. So we, were, we participated in that and this is what we got. So the reason that the FDA gave is we, they wanted to reduce the number of review cycles and the total time before uh, devices were cleared. What it means to us in industry is you get one shot at it. Once it gets rejected, clock starts again, and you have to come back and there's another 15 days. The new checklist, this was the criteria, and I'm gonna tell you what I think it means to us in industry. It was meant to be a compilation of regulations, uh, of statuses, uh, of statutes, guidance, review, everything under the sun. And what ended up happening, instead of finding the efficient intersection of all that data that needs to be put in for an initial review, what we ended up was what that slide that Kerry gave us with multi-page, multi-question, multi-part questions, compound questions that are actually, if you remember logic from your senior year in high school, it was a union, not an intersection. So that's where we landed. And it's much easier to form a union logically than an intersection. To do an intersection, you actually have to do a little discerning work. Uh, they wanted to create an objective tool to understand the components. And did you have a complete 510K? Couple of things here. What they're saying with this, in, 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 in my thought process, it's important to us, so it better be important to you. The danger here is who defines what objective is. Is it objective? Who gets to define it? And the FDA does. So there's very little wiggle room. The last thing, as we stated before, is they're supposed to be only evaluating the presence of an item, not the adequacy in principle. So mostly administrative. The last thing the FDA stated is we want to make efficient use of our resources which the semi-cynical view that I have is, it's more work on our part. If we do more work, they can become more efficient. So it's a shifting of the resources, especially early on. It's much higher risk, much shorter time. When you have less resources at the FDA, efficiency, looking at a boatload of data with a short amount of time up front, very high risk. We need to put that into our new product commercialization process. That's the bottom line. Is this making sense to everybody? It's not a free ride. This can have a true impact in how you get your products to market. So how, are, how is your new product development process and your projects affected? Well, number one, timing, schedule, budget, resources. If you get rejected, if you get the RTA ding, clock resets to zero, and you start again. At the bottom where I said the effect of, uh, can be cumulative, that's what I'm talking about. Number two, it's not an interactive process. What we bought ourselves in those first 15 days is we send our stuff in, stuff comes out, done. We don't get a chance. So because we were yapping off about, oh, we want quick, we want upfront, we want decisions, that's part of what we got. No interaction. There's no limit of the number of RTA cycles. And that to me, I think, is one of the most dangerous things. It hasn't come to fruition. We just need to monitor it. But 15 days at a time plus the time in between to react can add up pretty quickly. If you are on a very short time frame as far as your product development cycle, if you are in you know, hips, knees, spine, where new products, really significant products get launched every five to 10 years, not as big a deal, three or four year projects. If you're doing stents, if you're doing pacemakers where the technology changes every six months, two or three cycles, 20% of your product development cycle. So it is significant. The next one is the concept of uh, substantive interaction and the MDD decision. These are actually pretty cool, and I wanted to put them in here to show that it's actually not just a one-way street, is there is now a decision point where the FDA will tell you if this is gonna require, if your exercise with your submissions can require more interaction than usual. And in principle, they're open to actually reversing the first 15 days where there's no interaction and really getting into the weeds with you, which I think potentially is, is a favorable thing. The last one is, and I think this they actually did hear us. Remember at the, uh, after 90 days, they'd stop the clock if it didn't come to a decision, kick it out, and then you'd have to start all over again. There's actually a tool now, the uh, missed uh, MDUFA de uh, decision, 
where if they don't think they're going to come to a decision in the 90 days, they tell you, and you can start, you can continue to work on it without restarting the clock, which I think that actually is a, a silver lining in this whole process. The last couple of things I'm going to talk about, or the, the main, last thing is, even though there's not a lot of interaction at the beginning, we can create the interaction by talking to the uh, reviewer, because now there's a very specific point where the lead reviewer is going to be identified and sent to you and be part of the process. So especially in the tail end, if there's, substantial, if there's going to be substantial interaction, or you're going past the 90 day, and there's going to be a lot of back and forth with the FDA, and I think this has the potential to be very good, is please make your 510K an integral part of your new product realization, new product commercialization, new product introduction process. Anybody here that can give me a sense on whether, when you're looking at your design control, new product commercialization, PMO office, is 510K part of it and is it consistent throughout? Is it addressed at all your design reviews and is it addressed by the team? Because it's important for the whole team to be involved now because the FDA is looking at all the elements early now. Make sure, and this is something that is, uh, this could be a, a, a very useful unintended consequence of, of, of this change, is in the traditional model, even in cross-disciplinary teams, people take care of their own element, and there are very few things that everybody participates in. And I think that our two elements that are highly underrated by not having participation of multiple experts in multiple fields. One is regulatory submission, and number two is intellectual property protection. Those are two areas that are multidisciplinary. Nobody in any company could be an expert on everything that goes into those two areas. And those are the two areas that are most, in my experience, securely guarded by the, uh, the fiefdoms. Patents, legal, and, and regulatory. Train everybody to understand that we work in a regulated environment, how important it is to participate, <coughs> and that what everybody does, especially now in the first 15 days, it's critical to success, to mission success. And the last one is, even more important now, make sure that you train the people that interact with the FDA directly, and that doesn't just mean your regulatory person on the team, but it means anybody, because there will be questions, especially when there's a lot of interaction towards the end of the project, make sure that everybody speaks the language and make sure that people have great communication skills. In my opinion, you don't only have to be very good technically in know the regulations, but the people that are great communicators are the people that are most successful dealing with the FDA. And I don't think that we, all of us have 20 years uh, of time to weed out who the best people are to do that. I think this should be a proactive, it's, it's a cost on your resources, but uh, uh, it, it's important. So just a little view into, from the industrial perspective, where this could go. It can affect your resources, it can affect your schedules, it can affect your effectiveness, but it doesn't mean that it's all uh, doom and gloom. Rob? For those of you that aren't intimately familiar with the 510K requirements, there are 20 sections to the contents of a 510K. They even provide a guidance document that lists the 20 sections and explains what's supposed to be in each section. So we've provided a, a graph here, and um, Carrie's done the bulk of the work. I just gave them numbers and rankings. But the top of the list there in the red are the two sections that are most likely to result in an RTA. We don't have FDA data to back this up. That would be nice to have but uh, they won't give us everybody's 510K, I don't know why. Um, and then the second category the, is sort of the medium risk. These are areas where you might get an RTA for something in those sections. And then the green section is unlikely. And primarily it's because the green section is forms that, it consists of forms that you're gonna fill out and uh, it's much more administrative, so there's not subjectivity in the eyes of the reviewer or in how you fill things out or provide information. But in the top section in particular, the FDA is asking for a lot more detail that, that, than they have in the past. But if your company is, hasn't done a 510K in a while or you have somebody that doesn't have a lot of experience, those yellow areas can be problems. And the next slide is a good example of that. Volume 9, Declaration of Conformity. Here's a section that's at the bottom, I think, of the first page or close to it of the RTA checklist. 
and they're just asking you, have you completed the form, FDA form 3654? Well, as the uh, name of the form would suggest, it's kind of boring. All it is is a form where you explain, did you comply with a standard the FDA recognizes, or did you deviate from it, and if you did, explain how? Well, it's a long form. You have to submit a separate form for every single standard the FDA recognizes. And just like I was saying earlier, the, the FDA surprises us with how much detail they want. If somebody submitted a lab report uh, for testing and they referenced one of those standards, so it's only a single mention buried in page 47 of a 200-page report. If you don't fill out that form, you're going to get an RTA letter. That's how easy it is to get an RTA letter. Somebody else's test report that you didn't go through with its fine-tooth comb has a reference to a recognized standard, so you need to include this form filled out for the FDA. Another example of a real RTA letter that a client of mine got back, they filled out, RT, filled out this form for a whole bunch of different standards, but they didn't, plot, they didn't fill it out for the ones that were obviously not applicable. So, for instance, if, if, you, have a, um, if you have a standard, a list of standards, and some of them are for, let's say, a wheelchair that is on the, um, for somebody that can move the wheelchair themselves, and another standard is for a wheelchair that is uh, electrically powered, they want to know why you didn't apply the one that's for the manual wheelchair for the powered wheelchair submission. This sort of goes back to the same kind of comments we saw earlier for the condoms that they want to know whether it's patient contacting. It's silly, obvious questions. We think it's obvious. The FDA says, no, nope, you need to specify. They're also saying you need to fill out this form. So here's a lot of labor that you're going to put into something that's absolutely pointless and adds no value. But the FDA says you shall, so you will. Volume 12, the substantial equivalence. This is one of those red items at the top of the pyramid. This is probably the most technically challenging part of a 510K submission, and it's the whole reason why the 510K process exists. If you are going to submit a 510K, you have to explain how it's equivalent to some other device that's already on the market under a 510K or something that existed prior to the FDA amendments. So it's a pre-amendment device. It's something that's been around a long time, really safe, great track record. Well. Let's see, if I have a knee implant that was made out of wood back in the 70s or 60s, and I have something made out of a titanium alloy now that has all kinds of coatings and uh, special uh, vitamin E added to it, those are exactly the same, right? Everybody wants that same 1970s technology in their knee. <laughs> so you can't even keep a straight face when you say these are absolutely the same. I, I like to use the explanation of, Here's the marketing department over here saying how this clinical data shows how everything is totally different from the competitor's product. And the regulatory person in the same company saying how this product is totally identical to the existing product on the market. Now, if this seems a little bit bipolar for a company, it is. But the FDA says, you know, please provide us a tabular document that explains point by point how it's equivalent or not worse than the predicate device. So identifying a predicate, this, this is probably the first thing that every company ought to be doing. And you might think, well, of course I'm going to pick the last device I submitted because we just made a minor change to it. Let's say the previous version was hydraulically powered and this new one's going to be, electronic, uh, going to be electrically powered. So all I did is change the power. And well, I added on a couple extra features, so I guess I need to do a 510K submission. I can't just do a letter to file saying, you know, it doesn't require a 510K. But in fact, when you do the analysis of what it's going to look like on a substantial equivalence table, you may realize that your competitor's product that already is electrically powered is the better choice for a predicate. So there's a lot of strategy that's involved in selecting your predicate device, and you have to be intimately familiar with all the competitor products in how they established their device was acceptable from a risk and um, safety and efficacy standpoint. And then you have to make that argument in a tabular form that some um, FDA 
administrative clerk that's been there three months is going to understand. So just picking your existing predicate device may not be your best strategy. In volume 11, this is the one that's going to look about 10 times thicker than you've ever seen before. They have all, each of these slides I have like part B on here. This is part B of the RTA checklist and it's fairly lengthy. They're asking for a lot more detail in what will be the device description than you've ever seen before. And things that you didn't think were important, they want to know about. And here's the other parts of the RTA checklist. And as we said before, it's a fairly long document. It has parts A through K. And I've indicated a couple of points here that might jump out and grab you, like is your labeling device specific? Is there a guidance document that the FDA has for that type of device? Um, that's important because they may say you shall have a label that includes the following information. The newer guidance documents that the FDA is issuing now actually do. There are, if you have sterilization, you may think, well, I'm going to reference the uh, gamma sterilization or the EO sterilization standard. Well, if you do anything that's a little bit out of the ordinary, you could dump yourself into a third guidance document that's out there or, or standard for non-traditional sterilization validation. So the FDA is getting tougher and tougher all the time. Every single time somebody has a recall, the FDA looks for what more regulations can we throw at them. So it won't get easier. There's no good hope in sight. But the best thing you can do is to try to learn this process really, really well. And as Jorge indicated, train your whole organization because one person cannot possibly do it all. It's a team effort to get one of these across the finish line. I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. So just to wrap up, I think the, the message here is that um, RTA is not going anywhere. So we need to find a way to, within our processes, within our organizations, accommodate it, cope with it, and try and work um, our way through it. Uh, the hope would be that that acceptance rate goes up, but I think that remains to be seen. Um, and clearly, the line between an administrative refuse to accept review and a substantive review has not been drawn very clearly at FDA. And so it behooves us to do our best to make sure that our submissions um, are going in. I think the anecdotes indicate that our submissions aren't as bad as um, maybe the failure rate would indicate. Um, it's that the decisions being made are not necessarily logical um, uh, or meaningful. Um, one anecdote that recently um, I read about was that uh, submission went in, they got an RTA, worked with the reviewer, got the, the concerns that the reviewer had brought up um, addressed, uh, sent it back in and got another RTA because the first reviewer was now gone and they got a new reviewer and all the, change, all the questions had changed. So I think there's still a lot of challenges um, here and we'd love to hear your stories and, and answer your questions. Thank you. We, make, we import blood pressure monitors and they've all been complied with by FDA. Except for one part of our hospital monitor, which is SPO2, we sent that in six months ago. We've heard nothing. Is that good or bad? Sent in your 510K six 510 months ago? 510K, yes. So you got past RTA. It went for substantive review, and you have not heard back? or? We've heard nothing. We thought we'd have a, an answer a month ago. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would call your reviewer as soon as possible. They're supposed to get back to you within 15 days. Yeah. Thank so you. Do, you have, do you know for sure they got it? Because that, that's the, that would be my first question is, did they indicate that they actually received it? Because you should get a letter that says that they got it. That's not my department. <laughs> it's my partner's department. Everybody needs to be trained. So about the training. <laughs> you were saying like something about the entire organization, right? Let us know if we can help you, though. <laughs> that, the same comments apply to not just 510Ks, but any, any interaction with a regulatory body it doesn't matter who it is. Do not wait for them to call you. Do not wait for them to email you. If you think you're, they're going to call you on Thursday, call them on Wednesday. Be polite about it. Be professional about it. But don't wait for them because they are administrative. 
they have a very heavy workload and they will forget, things get lost, and it's your fault. Yeah, one of the things I would say just to um, respond to that as well is a lot of the folks that I talk to are actually afraid to call FDA. Um, I can assure you there's some really nice people there. They're, um, they're hardworking people. They don't always make good decisions, as we've seen, but um, you should never be afraid to give them a call and say, hey, what's, what's going on? Um, they're not going to um, show up and inspect you the next day just because you called and said, hi, I'm over here, which I've actually heard people afraid to call FDA because they're afraid that means they'll get inspected. So um, that's the IRS. That's it. <laughs> so, so as Rob said, and, and as he said, it goes with any agency. Um, don't be afraid to pick up the phone or get someone like Rob or me or whoever to call them for you um, and, and find out what's going on on your behalf. Hi. Um, I just we just started our submissions, and actually we haven't uh, done a five. We're, we will do a five ten k, but right now we just submitted for our pre submission. Uh, meeting and so how useful is that meeting in terms of passing something like RTA and are the folks there that will talk to are they well versed in the RTA issues and maybe give some advice in terms of how to pass it the, f the quick answer is it depends <laughs> if it is a device that has a predicate that's obvious and there's a very similar product on the market it's a waste of your time and money. To give you an example, if you go through the 513 process, 513G submission process, which I gave a link for up there, you're gonna wait 60 days for an answer, you're gonna pay a few grand for it, it's gonna be non-binding, and it'll probably be wrong. That's the good news. <laughs> However, if you have a device that's totally different, and you're having a lot of trouble identifying a predicate device, and when you call up a consultant, they scratch their head at several times, you probably need the pre-submission process. I don't think the 513G process is gonna be much good to you, but you probably need to still talk to the FDA because you may be headed down the road of a de novo submission and you're trying to avoid a PMA. And you probably don't wanna do this without a lot of coaching and preparation in advance. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I would follow up with, um, you can you can still interact with FTA without going through the pre-submission process. So you can talk to a reviewer in your reviewing branch and get it gets some questions answered, and then you don't have to go through that. That may answer your questions. Um, if they advise you to do it, then I would do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Whether or not that's going to help you with RTA, um, I think is questionable. I don't think we know the answer to that yet. I think it depends on whether or not the reviewer that would be handling your RTA and your submission is going to be in your pre-submission meeting. And I don't think there's any guarantee that that's the case. That, that's a good and the bad of it. It's the RTA is much more dependent on the lead reviewer, on the individual reviewer. The 513 process is really good for more overall, put your finger in the pool, see what the temperature is. That's really good for if you need that, if you're in that kind of gray space of uh, technology, uh, then, then it's, it's worth something. I would also remember what Rob said, and that is that anything in those pre-submission meetings is non-binding. So don't be surprised if they come back and say, oh, you know what, actually, we'd like to get this additional information. One of the ways you can avoid um, that kind of ambiguity is to go into your pre-submission meeting highly prepared with a very specific list of questions. Um, what I usually tell clients is don't ask FDA how to do it. Tell them how you're going to do it and see if that's okay. Um, it's usually going to be more beneficial and productive that way. I'm from Bionic Products and um, we manufacture a negative ionizer of oxygen which we export globally, 50 year old company. And we've had TGA approval in Australia for quite a few years. I'm just about to go down the process of the, um, um, the de novo 510K that I learned about yesterday. Yep. Uh, with the FDA and uh, actually have an appointment with you, Robert, next week, but you probably don't know that yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what my question relates to is our particular medical device, um, we had to fight in the Supreme Court for eight years to prove that we can make the medical claims that we are making in Australia. And um, 
it got us to the point where we are the only one registered in Australia and TGA has told us they will not register anybody else. Plus we have global patents protecting our, our science anyway. Um, but from my discussions so far with the FDA, my intended purpose is that I'm allowed to say in Australia, I would not be allowed to say in the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, that actually presents a huge problem because with my websites and international websites, how can we communicate to the consumer in a language that they can understand what our device can do if we have to try and fit within different jurisdictions globally when the internet um, goes across so many different regions? I don't know how to fix this issue. Uh, Rob will give you some really good advice next week, but it's a huge labeling problem. Um, and so the, the key is, I think, going to be to work with FDA to generate a web presence that is US specific. I mean, other companies have had this concern. Um, there are indications overseas, you know, for example, um, in uh, hips, for example, if they do resurfacing, it's cleared overseas and it's not cleared in the US. Um, things like that. So I think it's a matter of working with, um, it's, it's a labeling and marketing issue that you're going to have to create one that's very specific to the US. And then on your other OUS web presence, it's going to need to be very clear that the indications that you're describing are not cleared in the US. And so that it's a challenge. It's certainly very complex. Rob, you want to? The only thing I would really add to that without getting into specifics that we don't have time for, would be that your distributors also need to follow you. Mm. So one of the ways to irritate the FDA severely is to sign up a bunch of distributors that create their own websites and do their own thing. Because you're the legal manufacturer that's on the label and you're the one that's going to get in trouble with the FDA, not the guy that's just shipping it. Our next question comes from uh, Dick Derizio. He is with Notified Body to UVSUD, He's also one of our sponsors, and I'm interested to uh, hear what you have to say. Well, my comment comes from many years of living the dream, doing 510Ks and PMAs. And just to <laughs> reinforce something that Jorge said about getting the right people with the right expertise, since a lot of people here are involved with new product development, Often what would happen is the R&D group would keep regulatory out of it until the very end, until they started throwing all the reports to them. Mm -hmm. And I ran QARA for many years in companies. The fact is they missed the sizzle of going to clinical advisory boards, meeting with the key of, uh, opinion leaders who were talking about the new technologies, and they never had a chance to get excited and find out why they could support the indications and claims. So whether it's a quality engineer or a regulatory uh, manager or specialist, having them involved at the earliest stages really gets them excited and makes them much more conversant with FDA in terms of the values of that device. Yeah, actually, one of the things we wanted to do at 10X, and there just wasn't enough warm bodies to do it, but it, it's still something that we want to promote, and that is what we call kind of your blue-collar regulatory, for uh, it's kind of our term for it, and that is training your operations and manufacturing and quality people to understand their role in the regulatory process, whether it's submissions or compliance. We're not trying to train everybody to be a regulatory specialist. Not everyone likes to read the CFRs at bedtime like Rob does, um, but, um, and I wouldn't know anything about that. But they do, ha having a basic understanding of their role in the quality system, in their role of generating those reports for your submissions so that you can get past RTA, just having a general sense of it can change how they think about the work that they do and lead to better overall compliance, um, both from a quality system perspective, but also lead to greater efficiency. So I think that's a really good point, is that regulatory shouldn't be um, relegated to the regulatory space only, it should be pervasive throughout your organization. If you have a guy or a lady at the end writing a 510K, RTA city, absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to add one more point. I like your comments about uh, getting regulatory involved early, mm -hmm. but um, I actually started out in R&D. So the last thing I did in my career was quality and regulatory. 
And I think that's benefited me tremendously because I can walk into design meetings and I speak their language, I think their way, I've done their job, and I can help them do what they're doing as well as teach them what I do. But the, I know that regulatory pathways and regulatory uh, strategy is not all that exciting to the, the R&D team, but when I can give them a list, step by step, of these are the tests that you're gonna have to do for verification validation, and I can guarantee you it's 100% of the list, I won't add on more later, that's really helpful to them. It's their yellow brick road. All they gotta do is stay the path and do those tasks. And if I can give it to them before they've decided what the design solution is going to be, whether it's gonna be battery powered or line powered into the wall, that's extremely valuable to them because they can say, well, which solution will be easier to pass that test? Because I've already told them the tests. And so I've actually had several R&D people say, this is fantastic. I've never had one this good before. Well, that's because you ask for it a week before you want to submit. <laughs> it's not a checkbox in your, in your technical file or your DHF. It's something that's supposed to help you plan your whole entire design project. So if you don't do it early enough, it doesn't have much value. The good news for all of you and, and those of you watching is Rob is really good at what he does. He leads our QARA subgroup, which in my view is our best subgroup for the entire group. He, he pours himself into it every week and writes something really, really meaningful. Um, so all of that goodness means he's really, really busy. The bad news is I don't get to hang out with my friend on Skype so often anymore. So, uh, Visma, you had a question. Hi, and I just spent a, a year inside FDA as an industry expert as part of their Entrepreneur in Residence program. And yes, those challenges are there. There's also an interesting dynamic of when we were starting to just, you know, pitch some of the ideas in the pre and post rebalance, which is one of the, the session, the, the cohorts I led. And it was interesting to see how much pushback came from industry to not change it because they use FDA as their legal buffer of once it's approved by FDA, we have less legal cases against us. So just to put a little bit of, one of the reasons FDA keeps having all of those more data, more data, is that they're the ones that are dragged down in front of Congress, not, not everyone behind the scenes, and industry then wants to continue to use them. So just giving that perspective, as they're making these regulatory changes and these guidances that are coming out as part of that strategic plan that we help them make for this, this year, that's also behind the scenes. Yeah, I think um, when it comes to doing a 510K versus a PMA, we'd all prefer the 510K, please, because you don't have to have the clinical trial. I will say, as someone who works with clients in adversarial situations where they're either being sued or they're in, in other um, adversarial situations, that um, getting your device cleared by FDA does not really give you a whole lot of buffer against um, liability or litigation. Um, PMAs, you get to deal bit. with a, you get a little more protection under preemption, but with the 510K, getting your device cleared, it rarely provides much of a speed bump. So um, I think while that might be um, some motivation for industry pushback, I think that there, the greater motivation, and, and this is just my personal opinion, is um, given the choice of doing a clinical trial and spending that time and money and burn rate versus uh, 510K. Um, 510K, as much of a pain as it is, as much of uh, RTA is a speed bump now, again, um, it's still a more timely and more efficient pathway to market. So I think there's a number of reasons for that pushback. Rob, you uh, told a story about how uh, the bipolar organization has a marketer saying, brand new, fantastic, and regulatory saying, it's completely like the other thing. Um, Ed Black is um, the, as you know, uh, on our medical devices group advisory board, and he's my go-to for matters relating to reimbursement and health economics, and uh, he participated in a workshop yesterday where he showed two triangles one of them pointing up, one of them pointing down. And he was making a comparison of the things you need for FDA and the things you need for CMS. And uh, I wondered uh, if I could ask Ed to, to comment on the presentation and, and what challenges and, and what possible solutions, you know, 
finish us off here with some, with some good news. <laughs> No, the fun of my job is telling entrepreneurs their, their new technology won't get paid. That's what yeah. people like I get, get paid to do sometimes. The comment I made, and uh, Doug Limbach was here, it, it came up, I think, in the course of talking about the difference between patent protection, working with the patent office, working with the FDA, and working with the CMS, is that there are predicate devices that help you get through FDA clearance, that can hurt you when you try to get intellectual property patents, that get even more confusing when you describe them differently to CMS. And you have to be careful when you talk to three federal agencies who all don't necessarily talk to you until you leave an audit trail that could come back to bite you. And the other, the other thought was that, um, regarding the triangles I show, is that the FDA and all the work that you do to get a product clinically approved is focused on isolating all the other um, variables outside of an equation to demonstrate that your technology does exactly what it's designed to do so you can meet that requirement for being safe and effective. But when you take that technology into the real world and health plan medical directors look at that and try to figure out what that's going to mean to the populations they cover, they look at this from a completely different perspective. And they know that when you take your clinical trials to the best university medical centers and the best surgeons and others, they aren't the ones who are going to be using the equipment once they approve it for coverage within their service areas. So there's a completely different view of the world when it comes to covering something because not everything that is safe and effective, which is the mantra of FDA, is reasonable and necessary for treating any particular medical condition, which is the, the harbinger of Medicare and third-party payer coverage. They're, they're the left and the right arms of the federal government that just look at the world much differently. And before we go, I'd like to thank my friends Jorge Ochoa, Carrie Keene, and Rob Packard. Thank you.